there, and welcome to Roundtable. I'm your host, Adam Cook. Provincial politics is starting to heat up again, especially with the Nova Scotia legislature about to start sitting. And with this in mind, I thought it would be good to hear from three Cape Breton MLAs from three different provincial parties. We're pleased to welcome back to Telliel's Roundtable show, Kendra Coombs. She's the NDP MLA for Cape Breton Centre Whitney Pier. Joining her for the first time on our MLA panel are Richmond PC MLA Trevor Boudreau and Liberal MLA for Sydney member two, Derek Mumberkett. Well, it's good to have you all here. We have a number of topics we're going to be discussing over the next little bit, so let's get right to it. First of all, it is the one-year anniversary of the election and swearing-in of Tim Houston's PC government. We will begin with the government caucus member, Trevor Boudreau, to give some thoughts about looking on this anniversary. Trevor, uh, your thoughts about how the past year has been, both for the government as a whole and for you personally? Well, to be fair, uh, uh, Adam, it feels like it's happened about a month ago. And uh, yeah. and I say that in, in jest, but... Um, I, I think my my colleagues who who both um, been MLAs for quite a bit while longer than I have would, would would attest to this. Like there's, you're you're basically taking water from a you know from a fire hose. It's not you're learning on the fly in terms of what uh, what it is that that I'm trying to do, and um, and certainly you know just trying to get a handle on 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 the roles and responsibilities as a constituency MLA, but also as uh, as someone on a number of committees. Um, and also, you know, um, supporting and promoting uh, the, the government's great work that we're doing to to try and help Nova Scotia. So, you know, a year, um, you kind of hope you're getting into the swing of it and getting a good feel of how how you can make a difference. And and that's kind of where I'm at right now. So I, I feel like I have a great team here with me in my constituency, and I feel like we have a great team here, uh, in government. And um, and I and I and I do think we have a great team in Cape Breton. And so we have a a number of different. Uh, all three parties are represented here in Cape Breton. And I think that's a that's a very good thing. So, all in all, it's uh, one year down, and and uh, more more to come. Let me springboard off that with a quick follow up question, Trevor. Do you feel there's any one or two themes that have really marked the first year of your government in power, or just activity in the legislature during your first year as an MLA? Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll kind of touch on both, and I mean, it, there's no surprise to anybody on this panel. Uh, our our government ran on on healthcare, and um, certainly that has been um, a large component of what we've looked at and focused on. And certainly that started off with um, the premier and the minister's um, healthcare tour and touring around the province, kind of getting a sense of what um, you know what what was out there, what um, healthcare providers and and others were feeling about where healthcare was going, and 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 that kind of took us off onto the path of, of that. But certainly there are other issues that uh, have come up and some more, you know, are more recent than others. But um, but in terms of uh, getting in the legislature, that was, um, you know, coming from municipal council. And I believe uh, the other two panelists have the same kind of background. It's a very different, um, it's a very different environment, um, I think, than than in, in municipal politics. So it was a lot of learning and uh, my role as whip, um, got me into the middle of it, and um, certainly um, uh, MLA Mumberkett and, and MLA Coombs and I have all had uh, conversations while while we're in the legislature, and it's a long process, long long process for sure. Mm -hmm. I want to shift things over to you, Derek Mumberkett. In that regard, uh, you are the longest serving of the MLAs that we have gathered here for the roundtable panel today. Uh, first elected in 2015, and you had experience in municipal politics before then. Your thoughts on the past year, not just on the performance of the Houston government, but also the past year for your party and for the legislature as a whole. Oh no! Listen, thanks, and and uh, it's it's really great to be able to finally participate. Uh, I do want to personally say, Trevor, uh, you, you, regardless of political stripes, you make friends along the way. Um, Kendra and I have known each other for a long time, so whether it's been through personal or or professional um, <clears throat> in in the roles that we've played, but you know, Trevor, you know, he he hit the ground running. He's taken on some some roles within the the within the caucus that I seen early when it came to trying to not only learn the ropes as we all do but also to take on that role kind of in a whip capacity and, and doing some of the other things that he did so you know i always say this i i've been around this game now 12 years and you make friends on all sides of it and uh, you just want to see people do well um, because uh, as trevor and kendra and i've said this to the other mlas from cape breton uh regardless of political stripes we want to do what's in the best interest of the islands so 
Um, I, I do want to say that personally, Trevor, welcome aboard. And I only see you progressing even into the more significant roles within your caucus. Now let's get to the politics of it all, which is the, yes. which is the, the year. So, so ultimately for us uh, as a caucus, um, you know, we've said it multiple times uh, is that uh, Tim Houston ran on uh, a foundation of fixing healthcare. And that was the whole premise of what uh, his his campaign was. They ran a very focused campaign. I'll give them credit uh, for that. Uh, and as a result of it, they formed government. Now, fast forward a year later, our wait list is higher than it's ever been. Uh, it has surpassed uh, 100,000. Uh, we're hearing conversations uh, about uh, folks that are being turned away from ERs. Uh, there's there's exhaustion and, and there's major concerns within our healthcare staff. Um, I would argue personally that uh, we continue to evolve through the, the journey of COVID and COVID will always be with us. But I, I would say that the government's handling of, of uh, the COVID pandemic uh, and, and leaving the, the, the healthcare system vulnerable has created some significant backlogs and surgery wait times uh, and has also uh, created uh, significant morale issues as, as uh, staff are, 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 are burned out. They, they, they're telling us um, that it's been a huge problem and, and we're going to feel the effects of this uh, from, uh, for, for a long time. We're, we're a year later into a government where um, inflation is a huge issue. The cost of living is a massive problem for people across Cape Breton and, and, and the province. And uh, what we want to see now is some support uh, for families as we move into the fall, which is going to be uh, very difficult. Uh, and we're going to get into the topic later around uh, the price of gas and, and, and the, the result of the, 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 the no plan that was not approved by, by the Fed. So we'll, we'll talk a bit about that later. But that's been really the biggest problem for us. Uh, on a positive note, I will give the government credit around the, their, their, their wage increase for CCAs. I think that was important. I think that that was something that was necessary for uh, for them and the work that they do to reflect at the work that they do. And, and uh, hey, of course, we're gonna we're gonna continue uh, as a, as a caucus. We have a new leader, Zach Churchill. Uh, we're excited about that. He has a, a, a lot of experience. Him and I actually served in, in many of the same departments together uh, as ministers. Um, and uh, we're gonna do our best to not only keep government into account, but also to bring solutions forward that we believe can help Nova Scotians. I'm glad you brought up Zach Churchill, Derek, because I did want to ask you a bit about that. Uh, I know that uh, the person who ran against him, the rookie Preston MLA, Angela Simmons, spoke fondly of her relationship with you. Now, how do you work with Zach Churchill now that he has put his own stamp on the party? And uh, what do you feel in terms of the role of Angela Simmons going forward? So, so yeah, I have a great relationship with both of them. Uh, Angela is absolutely amazing. Uh, her and I really uh, became close very early on. Um, she uh, has a bright future as, as uh, one of the leaders of this party. Um, and uh, I'm so proud of her for putting her name forward, to, you know, to come to, to put your name forward for the leadership of the party without, uh, without being there for, well, for less than a year is, is amazing. She ran an outstanding campaign and she's the deputy speaker of the legislature and, and that uh, she plays a prominent role there too as well. So, so the team has never really been closer than it's ever has been before. And, and Zach uh, and I, while we served together since 2015, uh, I actually replaced him in, in, in a few departments. I, I was in municipal affairs as minister after him. I was in uh, energy uh, on the resource side after him. And I was in education after him as minister. So I, I saw firsthand some of the work that Zach has done around pre-primary, the work that he's done around healthcare, the stuff that he was trying to do as, as minister, which the government has continued on, which I give him credit for. So uh, I'm excited about uh, what the future holds for the party. Uh, we're 17 caucus members strong uh, and uh, we're out across the province engaging with, with folks to determine uh, what the next steps are gonna be and, and what they wanna see moving forward. All right. Thank you, Derek. Kendra Coombs, your party also has a new leader, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Claudia Chender putting her stamp on the party. But in addition to that, can you tell me just how you're feeling about the way things are going just in terms of dealings in the legislature, but also looking back on the first year of the Houston government? Yeah. So the, let's go first year of Houston government. Um, you know, Derek already pointed it out that you know, we have a, a, over 11,000 uh, Cape Bretoners on a, the a wait list for a family doctor. Um, we've had more code criticals in the past year than we've had um, previously. And we have now more Cape Bretoners, I think over 10,000 Cape Bretoners who leave ERs without being seen. That was an increase in 40, 47%. 
um, from la from the last year. And so, you know, we have a problem in our healthcare system um, that is seems to be increasing uh, rather than decreasing at the moment. And I know um, the premier has said that it's going to get worse before it gets better. And my line has always been, well, tell us what the worst is. Tell us where we, you know, what that's going to look like so that we are prepared. We have, you know, people can be prepared for that kind of worse because to me, um, I don't want to see it get worse. I want to see it get better now and quickly. Um, and the other thing that has come up has been the cost of living has completely has increased and has made it um, almost unattainable for many people to stay in their homes, um, to put to put uh, food on their tables um, and get the necessities such as medications that they need. Uh, we've seen that rise, uh, which has had tremendous effects also on our healthcare system. And we've seen an increase. We've seen an increase in my office of people who are in need of de are desperate, desperate need of housing. Um, I don't know how many people have come to me saying, "I'm homeless. I'm couch surfing," um, or "I'm about to be homeless in the next month or two. And we're trying to get them into housing, but there's no housing. Um, there's there's little to no housing. Rent supplements are no good unless there is a places to rent, and so we are increasingly seeing this issue. We saw it first in Halifax, but now, um, Derek, I know you've seen this in Sydney. I have it in my writing as well, but mine's it mostly a lot, of, a lot of woods, but people living in tents. Um, and I, I don't know, Trevor, I'm pretty sure, I'm, I'm sure there's that, that situation in your writing as well. It, it, it's, it, it's tragic, it's frustrating, and it makes you, you know, you're, you know, it makes us want to work even harder for Nova Scotians to make life more affordable, to ensure that people have the health care they need when they need it, and um, to help with the cost of living. That is, that's been our focus as a caucus, are those, th are, are those things, um, as well as, you know, just recently look at the ECEs, early childhood educators, and, you know, they need a raise and they need benefits, just as the CCAs have, and they are starting to and have a great campaign going. So we're looking at that very closely. And so those those are a lot of the things that we're focusing on because we're just seeing things get more, are, are getting worse and more unattainable for people. And I do wanna pick up on a couple of those themes as well, uh, Kendra, over the course of this conversation. Quickly, uh, before we check in with one of the other MLAs, uh, I wanna ask you about Claudia Chender becoming yes. the NDP leader for Nova Scotia. Uh, your thoughts on her work ethic and also what she brings to the party. Work, uh, work ethic, uh, Derek, I'm sure you can attest to this. There's no one who has a better work ethic than, uh, than Claudia. She is bar none, uh, she's intelligent, She's a fighter and she is committed to making things better for Nova Scotians along with us, with, along with our caucus. She is, um, she's really somebody who lo loves uh, partnerships. She loves the communication. She loves talking and finding and listening, really listening to what people are saying and, and hearing it and making actions out of it. And mm -hmm. it's been, it, it's been, it's been great for our caucus. We're not new to women leaders. Uh, no, we've, no, we we we've had quite a few of them. Uh, one very personal to me, my aunt Helen McDonald, and so mm. this is so to have Claudia is very natural. It, it's it's a very natural fit for our party, and the on a personal note, she's been the my biggest supporter with regards to um, after having my second child. She she was my biggest supporter um, and helping me find. Um, find the, you know, helping me even get into back into the legislature virtually. She was the biggest supporter of, of doing that. And, and I just see us just growing under with Claudia's leadership. Uh, as the TikTok generation is fond of saying, I was today years old when I found out that Helen McDonald was your aunt. So <laughs> I'm glad to see that's connection. That's great. I want to pick up on leadership for just a moment. And Trevor, I want to shift this over to you. Uh, we've been talking about the new leaders for the Liberals and the NDP, but I want to ask you a bit about uh, your thoughts on Tim Houston's leadership. Uh, obviously, uh, you don't ever want to base the conversation around polls, but a new narrative research quarterly survey not only puts your party ahead of the, the other two, but also suggests 
that Tim Houston is still the most popular preferred choice for premier. Why do you think people are gathering around him uh, based on his first year performance? Uh, what do you think he's done to win the people over? I think uh, when you know when people got to see uh, uh, the premier in action uh, when when he when he became premier and they got to really uh, see how much he really does care um, and I I mean you can talk about a lot of our all the MLAs I do believe care but 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 you know he cares uh, and and it really shows he um, he is dedicated to to you know making a difference for for Nova Scotians on a number of different fronts but um but really you know something that i think surprised a number of different people is when he thought you know if he's if mm -hmm. he's done something that he felt was was wrong or needed to be corrected he has kind of done something different than a lot of politicians have done and and that said you know i've made a mistake here or we've made a mistake and we're going to adjust it and um th that's happened a couple of times and certainly you know we're always evaluating what we're doing and making sure that we're doing best for Nova Scotians and and you lead by example. And so our premier has done just that and has fought for Nova Scotians um, wherever he has gone. And, um, and whether it's working with uh, the, the federal government or um, engaging people across the uh, across the globe to, to try and support Nova Scotians. So so that's what that's what they're seeing. Um, they also see somebody who is committed to, you know, upholding what it is he said he was going to do. And so. Yes, healthcare is uh, in crisis, and and we've admitted that, um, and we are working on it. And certainly, it's like uh, like the saying, yeah, "eating an elephant is one bite at a time." And certainly, you know, if you were to take a list of all the accomplishments in healthcare that we have done, and all of the all of the different um, the things that we've tried to do, um, the list is quite long. And 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 and, and, and you know, the, it, we're never. We're never going to be able to do everything all at once, and certainly the opposition parties present what they feel um, w would help with that, and you evaluate that as you go along, along with the plans that you have as a government, and and he's done just that. So that, I, I think that is um, a big part of it. Well, let's stay with healthcare for just a moment and uh, bring Derek and Kendra in on the conversation as well, too. I want to start with you, Trevor, because, yes, uh, we're breaking off pieces of the elephant, uh, eating it one piece at a time. Uh, the premier recently uh, caught both compliments and some flack for suggesting that Nova Scotians really don't have that much to complain about when it comes to health care. That being said, your party and your government have introduced a couple of different things. We saw the virtual health care options that were rolled out earlier this week. And we also saw just a week ago today, uh, the Department of Health and Wellness working with immigration officials to fast track healthcare professionals from Ukraine. Uh, your thoughts on whether either of these approaches could wind up helping, helping both here in Cape Breton and around the province? Yeah, no, thanks for that, Adam. And it's, um, you know, it's it's no secret. We're, we've been, you know, we've been short doctors, just, you know, and I've noticed it in rural Nova Scotia for a long time. I, you know, I am in healthcare. My wife is in healthcare. Um, we've been living this life for, for the 14 years we've been back in this province. And Certainly, virtual care is a tool to help Nova Scotians um, get care that they need, uh, the timely care that they need. And certainly, um, announced you know more recently, uh, and as of this morning, people who um, maybe didn't get an invite before, as as was as was the case, it's open to everybody who is on the need a family practice um, list now. So so people were going on this morning and registering for that. Um, I did want to pick up qu quite quickly uh, the Minister of Health actually came to Richmond last week and had a visit with me and we visited the um, Dr. Kingston Memorial uh, Center and we had a chat about kind of um, the, the the list and the 100,000 people on the list and we, we recently had a nurse practitioner go into that clinic they started making phone calls and what, what the clinic was actually finding out is a lot of the people who are on the list actually have now um, uh, access and have a primary care practitioner. So the list itself um, is a tool that is is has its uses, but I also think it has its limitations. And so I, I just wanted to point that out. In terms of um, um, the announcement with, re with respect to Ukrainian healthcare providers, I think that's a wonderful opportunity. And I think um, going forward, I'm, I'm hopeful that it will be broadened and looked at for a number of different reasons. We have a number of Germans um, healthcare providers in our um, region that I think um, also have the skill set that they can um, certainly help our, our communities here. But um, this is about attraction retention of, of healthcare um, people. And that's why we have um, an office that is dedicated to that. And we're looking at innovative ways 
of trying to, and, and there was a recent announcement with the nurses um, um, to look at ways of how we can speed up the process of getting nurses licensed in Nova Scotia. So these are all innovative ways that we're trying to um, support the healthcare system in Nova Scotia. All right. Thank you, Trevor. I'd like to get uh, Derek and Kendra to weigh in on this. And uh, I want to begin with you, Derek. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, the Houston PC party ran a tight campaign fixated on fixing health care. Uh, your thoughts about some of the things Trevor's talking about, but also if the things that have been done by this government aren't working, what would you propose that they do? Oh, no, listen, uh, I appreciate what Trevor um, brought, is bringing forward. The virtual care actually started under our government, so we started with the pilots. So so I'm, I'm happy to see that the government continued on that to expand um, uh, virtual care to, to everyone. Um, I hope, you know, that lo logistically it works out and, and folks aren't waiting too long to hear back. Um, and I really appreciate the, su and the support that uh, the primary care providers are providing to that service. So that's something as a caucus we started. Uh, and of course, we continue to support it. And, and I congratulate the government for getting to this point uh, where they can expand it to everyone. Um, and as Trevor said, like there's a lot of different initiatives that governments will try to bring in when when they're there. We we were involved with uh, immigration when it came around to medical professionals. We were providing tuition incentives uh, for for primary care for, for doctors to go into rural parts of Cape, Cape Breton, for example, or Nova Scotia. We were providing tuition relief. Um, we got into paying nurse practitioners uh, to have a bigger role within the healthcare system, uh, and we were we were big on collaborative care as well. So. Um, the, some of the some of the things that I'm seeing uh, are things that are carryovers of of what we actually started. Uh, I'm very happy to see uh, the government continue. The Ukrainian piece is something of interest too, as well. That I think that's great. You know, in any time that we can we can do that. I think there's some work that we could also do around CCAs uh, as well. Uh, I've been talking to a few students who went to Cape Breton University who graduated uh, who are traveling within provinces right now uh, and. And they actually want to meet uh, with uh, with uh, the department. I'm hoping I can have that set up through through my friend in Richmond. Um, but uh, when you get to the numbers, though, like I don't, I I personally, and this is where history comes in, because um, I was around when Tim Houston was absolutely pounding away at the government over the wait list. His whole speech uh, as he went into the election was that it's never been worse. Uh, at the time, I believe there was just under seventy thousand on the wait list. Um, and now I find that, and again, this is not a personal reflection of, 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 uh, of uh, you know, my friend from Richmond or the, or the health minister. I, I appreciate that she, they're going around and touring, but those numbers have been used and used and used uh, for, for years by Tim Houston. And Tim Houston was ruthless in his attempt uh, to make sure that we, the government wore those numbers uh, every day. And, and when he comes out and he says that anybody who's criticizing the healthcare system uh shouldn't be he was the greatest champion of criticizing everyone within the healthcare system not only not only the politicians but to a point i believe at one point uh he was he was referencing deputy ministers in, in political roles and and i just I, you know it's one of those things where we all want to do the right thing uh for healthcare uh as a caucus we're going to bring forward solutions that we feel can help uh, as i said i'm happy with some of the things i'm seeing with the government but but there was nobody more ruthless than Tim Houston when it came to his attacks on not only the politicians, but on the healthcare system. And he ran a campaign, as I said, on, on healthcare, fixing it. Um, and he's got a lot of work to do. So to use the healthcare analogy, wounds are still fresh from last summer's well, election it's just, campaign. It's just, yes, it's, it's just ironic that he said that when he was, I would argue, probably the biggest champion of using that information and attacking and attacking and attacking and attacking the healthcare system especially during covid when we were the when we were the uh the envy of the world as a province where our case counts were low and we had amazing leadership under stephen mcneil and, and ian rankin to keep cases low uh, he was still attacking the healthcare system and now here we are and we're one of the worst jurisdictions now in north america when it comes to, to covid so um, it, it, that's it, it, that's my experience being around to, to see those debates for seven years. Um, that comment to me, I had a good laugh when I saw it. 
All right, Kendra Coombs, I want to pick up with this topic with you. Uh, what are your yeah. senses? I know you've expressed concerns I, about the healthcare yeah. system here in Cape Breton. Uh, what do you think the government should be doing and what would the NDP do differently uh, should it come to power? It's funny that you mentioned that because that was where I had a bullhorn at Derek, uh, <laughs> <laughs> at, at Jeff McClellan's office. <laughs> ah, yeah. Yeah, on, on healthcare. Um, but I, I never agree. I, I I never saw myself nodding along with Derek so much, <laughs> in the fact that you know, Tim Houston was in the legislature the spring before the election, consistently hammering the government, uh, the liberal government of the day on healthcare. And yes, healthcare was 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 bad, and I disagreed with some of the decisions or how the decisions were made by the previous by the previous liberal government. Um, and that was, you know, one of my hospitals as a counselor of District 11 was closing with no consultation from the community. Um, so I was right up in arms. And the fact that it was announced outside of my community that it would be closed, you know, I was even more up in arms and infuriated by it. I think I was, was the words I used during the time. Um, but yeah, I've watched healthcare um, become increasingly worse. Um, emergency rooms closures are worse. Um, just recently, um, it was Anaganish to New Glasgow, if I'm correct, but I know New Glasgow was involved. Uh, if you were um, a person going into labor, guess what? You aren't going to be able to deliver your child at, at that hospital. Um, that's in the, that's alarming. It, uh, we, we had something similar um, a, few, a, couple, a year or so ago on the South Shore or so, I believe where there was no anesthesiologist for any any person going into labor and they would have to go basically to Halifax. Um, so these are the situations. We have paramedics who are driving um, long, long distances without breaks, covering very vastly large areas because emergency rooms are so far apart that are opened for them to go to. And emergency rooms aren't open for people to get access to. So we have these severe problems. And the one thing we can't do is, is criticize people for criticizing uh, the healthcare system because you can't fix what we don't acknowledge as a problem. And as much as, as good as virtual care is, it's really, it's good if you don't have any other form of primary care, um, really, because most people are going to want to see their uh, their family physician uh, in person at some point um, because that's how relationships often develop. But uh, so virtual is is good. It helps where in places where there's access is not necessarily there. Um, and so it's a good stopgap for that. But I, I don't think it's the, it can't be the be all and end all. We can't just stop there. Um, Derek mentioned um, emergency care centers and they started it. I would disagree with you and that the NDP started collaborative emergency care centers and my riding benefited greatly from that collaborative emergency care center until the hospital was closed. And, um, you know, it was the envy. People would come from Port Mori and Lewisburg onwards to, to our collaborative emergency care center because of the reputation it had of getting people seen in a timely manner. Uh, by by a physician, and these these collaborative emergency care centers need to be more more of them need to be opened. There, we need to have more of those. Um, we need to allow full scope of practice from our uh, physician assistants, um, nurse practitioners, um, our pharmacists. We just need to allow that full scope of their full the full scopes of their practice to be utilized, and we need to utilize them more in in, in our in our hospital settings as well. I would say the other thing we need to do, and this is the problem that we have at Cape Breton Regional, is we have people, and also throughout CBRM in Cape Breton, is we have people living who should be in long-term care, living in acute care beds. And now we have people who should be in acute care beds, sleeping in emergency room, sleeping in, the, sleeping in emergency room beds, taking up those beds. That is a problem. And that has created what we've seen of the long wait list in the emergency rooms, people leaving without being seen, um, the code criticals and ambulance on not being being able to offload. And so we really need these, if we need to look at the low hanging fruits 
to allow full scope to practice, but we also need to look at those hot, those, those other areas where we need to build a lot more long-term care beds. Therefore, we need a lot more CCAs and LPNs and RNs on the floors of those and working that. So we really need that infrastructure to alleviate a lot of the pressures that we are seeing. And I would also say in Cape Breton, we need to look at cath labs mm. <laughs> because we have a high rates of, of heart disease and heart illnesses in our, in, in, our uh, in Cape Breton. I do recall, Kendra, that it was indeed in New Waterford that the first of the collaborative emergency care centers opened up under the Daryl Dexter government, I believe, 2012. So, so yes, uh, you're right. Uh, that uh, had a big impact on your riding of Cape Breton Center, Whitney Pier, for sure. And and, right. and the whole, and I would say all, and the, a lot of the CBRM area, which it serves because people are coming from everywhere to go to it. Mm. True enough. We have just enough time to tackle one more topic, and that is the Houston government's approach to reducing its carbon footprint and supplying a green energy plan to the federal government. Uh, Premier Houston had put out what he described as his better than a carbon tax program. Uh, this week, it was summarily rejected by the federal government, uh, who do plan to impose a carbon tax. And there was to be an actual update from the minister responsible, Tim Hallman, earlier today. Uh, that has been canceled due to uh, travel plans and to his inability to be able to put it all together working with the department. These things happen. But I want to uh, bring this to you, Trevor Boudreau, uh, your thoughts on your government's attempts to deal with this issue and basically what happens now. Yeah, no, and uh, I am not Minister Hallman, so like the uh, the update won't come for me. But uh, but certainly, look, um, it's been brought up a couple of times about um, the inflationary pressures that Nova Scotians are facing and 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 Canadians are facing. And look, under under the last uh, the Liberal government and actually the NDP government before that, we we become leaders. Uh, Nova Scotia has become leaders and done their job and done their role to help reduce uh, greenhouse gases. And um, certainly our plan, the, 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 the plan that the, the Premier has put forward, um, the plan would reduce, uh, you know, our greenhouse gas emissions by 17%, you know, by 2030. Whereas the federal carbon tax plan, based on kind of the information we have, would, would basically lower it by 2%, but we'll add an additional 14 cents a liter for gasoline. Um, this is especially concerning for people in rural Nova Scotia. So in our ridings where people have to travel for work and they don't have necessarily access to um, being able to walk to work or, or, or transportation, um, and those funds get kind of deviated towards those areas, it's more of an impact in our rural areas. And so the other concern that I have is a lot of Nova Scotians um, heat their homes with um, oil. And and really, our our the province has has stressed that that's that's something that we should look to, to you know to support from the federal government to help reduce that that dependency on oil. So, look, and the premier I think said it uh, you know uh, a couple of weeks ago. We, we our targets our targets exceed most of the other provinces across Canada. We've done our job. Um, we've done better than other provinces over the course of the year or over the course of the last number of years. And look, if we don't meet our targets, then put a carbon tax on. But we feel confident that our plan will get us to where we need to, um, to achieve the targets that we've set and that the federal government would set without having to penalize and tax people. So, so that has been the plan. And look, you know, obviously it's been rejected by the federal government. And so, you know, we're disappointed in that, but I, I have full faith in, in the minister and the premier to, to, to work on this file and, and, and their leadership in this. So... So, you know, it's um we I think we're all on the same page. We want we want to make sure Nova Scotians and and if you think about and Adam would know this and um and and so would my colleagues, like the straight area is poised for some really great green uh jobs and positions, whether it's in hydrogen or offshore wind. Like we want to be leaders. We have a task force here that is a, a group of individuals um from all walks of life, the municipalities, the mayor and the warden for the area. Um, the industry is on board and they all want the same thing. No, Port Hawkesbury paper had an open house last night about greening their energy and having their own wind turbines and, and being able to be a bit more sustainable and take some pressure off. That's the, one of the biggest users of, of energy in our, in our province. If not, it is the biggest. And, and, you know, Derek would, would certainly know that, but, but, 
we want, we all want the same thing, but, but where we are right now with the inflationary pressures, um, it's, it's, it's not a good thing for Nova Scotians and especially not rural Nova Scotians. So Derek Mumberkett, I uh, wanted to get your thoughts on this uh, from the perspective of the Liberal Party. Uh, your leader, Zach Churchill, and your party in general came out uh, highly critical of the approach the Houston government's taken. Uh, your thoughts on their attempts to try to tie this all up? Yeah, so so it's it's really laughable, to be honest, because, um, you know, I, I had the opportunity of the, the honor of being the, the, the energy minister for three years, and we had a very close relationship with the federal government when it came to expanding our efficiency programs into houses with uh, various heat sources. We built the best solar program in the country. We worked very close with First Nations. Uh, we're retrofitting 2,500 homes. Uh, our, our industry has grown significantly. So this is something that I've been heavily involved with, and it's always been there. And and a lot of credit to Ian Rankin, uh, particularly on this file, because he's an expert on it, because he was involved with the cap and trade program that we uh, negotiated that kept the prices at the pumps low. So so we, we, we had a plan in place. It was approved by uh, the federal government. It reflected the success that Nova Scotia has had in regards to uh, the programs, the initiatives that we put forward uh, for uh, reducing our carbon footprint. Um, very successful, uh, very proud of the staff uh, in the department uh, who were working day and night on some of the stuff and, and a strong relationship with the federal government. Um, now you fast forward to now, and they knew a year ago that this was going to happen, and they did nothing. They absolutely did nothing to negotiate with the federal government. And as a result of that, 14 cents a liter is going on gas December 1st. So the big announcement that Minister Hallman was apparently going to make is just on CBC, them asking for more time. Because again, they're not ready again. So, um, and and I'll give them, I'll give the government credit in the sense that you know, 14 cents a liter in inflation with the inflation that we have now in communities across the island and, and the province, this is going to be devastating. Mm. But as a former energy minister, I spent most of my time there to see the plan that went forward with no timelines. Uh, and obviously other provinces are into this right now uh, where they knew this was happening. They, 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 they have this tax. We knew we wanted to reflect at the time our success. We negotiated a made in Nova Scotia deal. It was approved for the last three years. And here we are, we have the letters, we have the documents as a caucus, they were told that this was going to happen and they really did nothing. What they did is they took their legislation with no timelines uh, and no ability to pay for it and put it forward and hoping that the federal government was going to do it. Or maybe they didn't want to plan at all. And, 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 and now what I'm seeing, which is unfortunate, is this the messaging that's saying, oh, we're so disappointed in the federal government. We're so disappointed in the federal government. Well, it's what did you do to talk to the federal government? What did you do to negotiate a deal with the federal government? I worked with the federal government for three years. As I said, we built some of the best programs in the country around energy efficiency and solar and wind. And Trevor's right, some of the greatest potentials in the strait. Looking at, uh, so, and I was involved with some of those conversations around the offshore wind. Uh, the green, the, the hydrogen is really exciting. Uh, and there was also conversations at the time about reducing the GHG footprint around the world as we were talking with Europe at the time about gas and, and, and other energy sources that they, they wanted to expand their their uh, supply matrix uh, and get away from Russia. Uh, so I was involved with some of that. And so those conversations, even before the terrible conflict that's happening over there now. So wrapping that all up, you know, again, CBC's on right now saying, well, they're asking for more time. It's like, well, you had a year. So where's your, you, you, you submitted nothing, you submitted no timelines, you knew that the price of carbon had to be articulated within any kind of deal, uh, and they didn't, they just didn't do the work. And, and I'm sitting there as, not as a liberal, I'm sitting there as a guy who's been involved with the energy side of it, knowing what I know, going like, I'm actually kind of shocked that that's what came out of the department is, is really nothing. So uh, we're in a situation now where this is really going to hurt Nova Scotians, and it will be interesting to see uh, what transpires, but the big announcement that was coming from Minister Hellman, there's nothing. It's just they're asking for more time. And Kendra Coombs, uh, we wanted to give the last word to you on this topic. Uh, obviously, it's going to have an impact, as you'd mentioned earlier, concerning people who are having trouble meeting prices that are rising on various things, not just gasoline. Your thoughts on how the Houston PC government has handled this file? Yeah, well, um, you know, I, I, I've always believed we need more benchmarks and more targets uh, with our climate change. Climate change is probably the one of the most pressing matters that are facing us as um, 
for in the for our gen for the next future generations, and and families are, you know, families have been hammered by 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 the inflation crisis, and they they really can't afford to pay more, and so I'm not under, so I if I'm understanding what the Houston government plan was i i'm not understanding why it was focused on uh, the 14 cents on gas which is you know three times less than gas increases people have been um been living through the past number of months right and so at least with the federal plan there's some financial support um for every for for all for nova scotians and so it seemed to me that the Houston's letter, this I believe thirteen-page letter, made no effort um, to avoid um, the mandated price on carbon. Whereas Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, and I think Alberta um, all tried to avoid uh, the price carbon, the uh, avoid the pricing carbon on, um, and all had that plan mandated on them. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity, though, to build a real strategy to price carbon and support to support Nova Scotians and so that we can create um, a cleaner, a greener um, future and economy, because that's what we really need to start. Our focus needs to be on, I, uh, you know, that that's just, you know, those are those are my thoughts and the thoughts that my colleagues and I share. All right. Thank you, Kendra. We have covered a lot of ground here in just a short time. Uh, I appreciate all three of you joining me here. Does anybody have anything they want to add just before we wrap up this afternoon? Derek? Yeah, no, no thanks. Uh, listen, thank you for, for having us on. It's always great to see both of uh, you, uh, Kendra and Trevor, and uh, to all the viewers uh, on the island. Uh, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't Big shout out to all the Mumbercats in Richmond County. I'll see, yes. I'll, see you, I'll see you at some point. I uh, never got there this summer, but reunions come. But uh, listen, I just appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and, and I think I just want to end by just thanking everybody on the ground over the last couple of years uh, during COVID who've been looking after us, whether you were in the healthcare system or whether you were first responder or whether you were a volunteer. Or It's been a tough goal for folks in Cape Breton and across the province. And uh, uh, I know that everybody's been working day and night, so uh, be well. Uh, and look after your neighbor and, and take care of yourselves. Really appreciate the opportunity. I want to. I want to also uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, it's it's great to be back here. I hope to get another invite. Um, I've always enjoyed my time, and um, I, you know, I can't wait for the legislative session for the fall to commence, so that we can start doing the work for Nova Scotians in the legislature. And uh, uh, that. You know, the constituency work we do on the ground is vital and important and equally as vital and important is that work that we do in the legislature together, um, whether even if it's debating uh, bills very um, rigorously and, um, you know, passionately. I, I think it's very important that uh, that we get that work done for Nova Scotians. And again, I want to echo Derek's comments about thanking all frontline workers. And I would add to those um, our our uh, educational staff as well that are go and all those that are back to school today. <laughs> so uh, welcome back to their year. Um, I hope it's a safe, hope it's a safe year. Um, and I hope that you know things like COVID and other uh, illnesses that seem to be on the go lately, um, you know, don't hit the schools hard. And the kid and everyone is safe. And I also want to thank all of our frontline workers that work in the tourism industry who are finishing up their year. Mm, yeah, Trevor Boudreau, last word goes to you. Uh, any final thoughts? Well, look, I mean, I'm very fortunate to have Adam and, and Talil here in my riding, right? So I'm, I, I, you know, I would say I've got. Um, Got an opportunity to have discussions with the community this way, and 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 um, kudos to you, Adam, and to your team for for doing these types of um, information sharing. And 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 I and and I and I will end on you know of course um, they they've spoke very well on on you know thanking frontline workers and and everybody. But I also uh, want to let people know that Cape Breton is well represented um, uh, in the in the legislature. So we have uh, people who really do care. Um, passion is not a not an issue in the legislature with Cape Bretoners. I can tell you that, and um, and and that's and that's a good thing because we have we have people who are looking out for everybody. And so I I would say all Cape Bretoners, your interests are being are being brought forward by by all of the different members. And um, 
and I do appreciate it. I, I really learn a lot and, and it's been, it's been great getting to, to know everybody. And I think what I've tried to do as a new MLA is make sure that I'm, um, I'm as as open and 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 try to get make sure I can understand where everybody's perspective is coming from, and I learn a lot from from Derek and from Kendra and and the other MLAs that uh, that we have in Cape Breton. So, kudos to them. And um, your break's over. Uh, committee started okay. this week. We had a health committee already this week, so <laughs> I'm uh, I'm back in Halifax every week now. Public accounts next week, and and uh, are, oh, are you? Uh, Kendra, I'm you're on, on. There you go. I'm now on public accounts. So, and by the way, so Kendra I was on you, health. He's a fantastic yeah. chair. I will give him that. Yeah. He's a fantastic chair. Look, it's about treating people with respect, and and I've and and being a chair of a committee. Um, this is off topic, really quickly, but being a chair of committee, if you're tr if you treat people with respect, they they treat your position with respect, and I've yes. I've had nothing but great. Um, great response from I, I've enjoyed my committee work that way I've learned a lot from from everybody and 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 I think that's that's how I've always approached it and I think I I, I would say the same about about Derek and Kendra so again I'll see everybody in, in Richmond again soon uh, and uh, hope everybody enjoyed this and there you have it ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for tuning in to the latest MLA panel for Talil's roundtable Thanks once again to my guests, Richmond PC MLA Trevor Boudreau, Liberal MLA for Sydney Member 2 Derek Mumberkett, and our returnee to the roundtable panel, Kendra Coombs, the NDP MLA for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Peer. If you have any ideas for future panel discussions on our roundtable series, by all means, please let me know. You can contact me directly, or you can send your ideas to Telil Community Television at the station in Arishat. And be sure to follow Telil on social media. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for tuning in to Roundtable this week. I look forward to seeing you again soon with a brand new show. Bye for now.